Rome was established as a monarchy, a kingdom, but in 509 BC, that kingdom is going to be overthrown when the last Roman king is removed from power and the Roman Republic is born, and it lasts from, 20, from 509 to 27 BC. When I say a government as a republic, I don't mean democracy. What I really mean is a government that is a mixture of democracy, aristocracy, and monarchy. In Greek terms, we would talk about an executive of some sort, like a basileus or an archon, a council of elders, and an assembly. And this system is the basis of all re classical republics. So in this early period, there are basically three political bodies in the Roman Republic. The Centurion Assembly was the Legislative Assembly. It was made up of citizens who were also the soldiers. But the men sitting in this assembly did not necessarily have an equal vote. They voted by centuries, that is, groups of 100 men. So let's say within this one century of 100, there's going to be 60 men voting yes and 40 voting no. That means in the century of assembly, there's one yes. However, centuries were formed on the basis of how, how much you could provide to the army, i.e. how much money you had. For example, the wealthiest of the Romans could provide 80 centuries of infantry and 18 centuries of cavalry to the army. The second wealthiest class, just 40 infantry. Then there's six classes of, of of Romans, and the poorest of them, of them all, can pool their resources and only give one century of infantry. This means, therefore, that the wealthiest Romans had 98 votes on the, on the Centurion Assembly, the second wealthiest 40 votes, and the poorest of Romans only one vote. Executive authority rested in the hands of the consul, and there were two of them. They were elected from the, the Centurion Assembly, and the Roman calendar was actually recorded by the by whoever was consul during that year. Men could be elected to the consulship more than once. The consuls were the chief administrative officers during peacetime and commanders-in-chief of the, of the army during times of war. When they, had, when they were in the field at war, they could act independently of one another. But at home, during peacetime, they had to agree with one another. They had to agree to take any action that they could take. The Council of Rome is kind of like the Gerusia of Sparta. In fact, senatus means old men in Latin, whereas gerusia meant old men in Greek. The Senate began in the monarchy as a body of advisors to the king, and continued not only through the Republic, but throughout the Empire as well. The Senate was made of the great men of Rome, and was basically a self-perpetuating body. Its membership was chosen by two officers called censors, who were also senators themselves. One could only become a senator if you held one of the magistrates that were available. Since all the members of the Senate held offices, they had led troops, and they therefore embodied Roman values of virtus, pietas, and gravitas, and these members also had auctoritas. The Senate had the right to advise count the consuls, and it was the consuls who presented the issues to the Centurion Assembly for action. The Senate regulated the receipts and disbursements from the Treasury, which meant that, which meant that they controlled the expend expenditure of funds. The Senate also had the authority to deal with all crimes requiring a, a investigation, like murder, conspiracy, and treason. Finally, later on, the Senate would have the power to deal with affairs outside of Italy. This is going to become very important over time. In those early days, the biggest problem that Rome faced was a conflict that historians call the struggle of the orders. Early Rome was very much like a Greek polis. The Romans created a class of aristocrats known as the patricians, and they had a, only they had full political rights. They, had, they made the laws, and they could design the laws to preserve their own wealth and power. For example, one law was that if a poor person owed money and could not pay it off, he and his family could be sold into slavery. The non-patricians were called plebeians, and this is somewhat of a, of a, of a of an oversimplification. It is possible that the patricians were kind of like the Lacedaemonians, that is, they were conquerors of the other peoples who became plebeians. Whatever the case may be, very early on, these two classes became hereditary. Patrician families only had patricians, so regardless of how wealthy or how poor the person could be. There could be also, you could also be a plebeian and all, but have a tremendous wealth, but you would still be a plebeian no matter what. The plebeians rightly believed that they were being oppressed, and they organized to do something about that oppression. 
In 471, they created their own council, the Plebeian Council, to represent their interests. The, this council chose ten men, called tribunes, whose job it was to speak to the patricians about matters that concerned the plebeians. The plebeian council could also pass res resolutions known as plebiscites. But the, from the formation of the plebeian council in 471 BC, the struggle of the orders is the story of how slowly but surely the plebeians got more and more rights. There are major steps. For example, in 450 BC, the assembly codified the Roman laws into what's known as the Twelve Tablets, or Twelve Tables, which, was de which declared that all free citizens had rights as well as duties. Perhaps in that same year, the tri each tribune was given the power to forbid any action that could harm or threaten a plebeian. In 366, a plebeian was actually elected consul, and from then on, it, was, it became a custom for one consul to always be a plebeian. In 287, the Centurion Assembly voted that plebiscites had the force of law, and that event was considered the end of the struggle of the orders. Now, the office of Tribune became very important. All the other offices were open to everyone in, by, by 250, but not this one. Only plebeians could be tribunes, not patricians. Tri tribunes had an unusual power. All of them had to agree before action could be taken by other magistrates. If only one tribune objected to what, he, what the consuls were doing, and the other tri tribunes wanted to do it, he could simply prevent it by saying veto, which means I forbid.